Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad you've decided to join us. This is a series of programs discussing the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this, is seri this particular series is the series for the second quarter of uh, 2012, the, the months from April to June. This is lesson number 11 in that series for June 16 of 2012. And we would like to ask you before we begin to bow your heads with us to ask God to guide us in our time together. Our kind and loving Father, you know how much we wish that we could do what you've asked us to do, all of us together, putting forth our best efforts so that this work can be finished quickly, that we could see you come in the clouds of heaven. We know there are yet things to happen between now and that day. Help us to prepare ourselves and to help others around us to prepare so that that may day may come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let the church know how important is it if you do something in terms of evangelism, in terms of witnessing, how important is it for you to report back to the church? Or maybe at least to your Sabbath school class. <clears throat> Were you talking about those little cards we used to fill out? Well, that's one way of reporting back. Um, I don't think that's the best way because, I mean, think about what motivates you. Did it motivate you to have finally someone, at the, after reporting those cards, maybe after a month or so, someone stands up and says, we had 30 contacts and we had 700 pieces of literature given out. Does that motivate you? Or does it motivate you more if someone says, uh, you know, last week, I had the opportunity to witness to somebody, and this is what happened. And they tell you the story. I think that's a much better motivator, personally. I want to hear what, and it gives you ideas. Oh yeah, yeah, I could probably do that. But does the Sabbath school class ever ask? We need to. I, in, in Ellen White's day, and now I, I don't know whether we could say it's not like that anymore, but she said there ought to be times when the whole church service is taken up by people giving these kind of reports. Have you ever been to a service like that? Are there any examples in the Bible of that? Well, there are some. Um, probably the, one, the ones that we're, we're going to get to some. Let's, let's just put it like that. Um, let's, well, let's pick out one. Peter and this is Acts 4, and I, I don't have time to read the whole chapter, but Peter and John, remember, had walked into the temple. They'd gone to the inner court, where they're, the bait, gate beautiful, where they're just about to enter into the, the area of the temple that was for Jews only. And there was this man who'd been lying there for years, crippled or whatever, I don't know how many years or how long. And, you know, he said, please, could you help me, you know? And Peter and John says, we don't have any money, but what we have will give you, rise up in the name of Jesus and walk. And the man went, jumped up, as you remember, and he went leaping and bounding into church. And pretty soon, what happened? Remember? All the authorities came. All the authorities descended upon them. And they said, who gave you permission to do this kind of stuff? I mean, God forbid that we do a good deed, right? And they... <laughs> They, they, <laughs> they were annoyed because the two apostles were teaching the people that Jesus had risen from the death. Just imagine that. Is this when the they, is that the church leaders? Yes. Well, the Jewish leaders in those the days. Jewish and remember, we're talking about Sadducees now. They were the ones in charge of the temple, and they didn't believe that a resurrection from the dead was even possible. And all of a sudden, here's a disciple standing in their temple, as they, they thought about it, preaching that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And not only that, look what happened next. They, they called him in, and Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, this is verse 8, answered the leaders of the people and elders, if we are being questioned today about the good deed done to the lame man and how he was healed, then you should all know, and all the people of Israel should know, that this man stands here before you completely well, through the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And you could just hear them cringing when he said that. Whom you crucified and whom God raised from death. 
Jesus is the one of whom the scripture says, the stone that your builders despised turned out to be the most important of all. Salvation is to be found to him alone. In all the world, there's no one else whom God has given who can save us. I mean, and you can just see them going, eh. they, they were ready to throw stones, I'm sure. But now, just a minute. We are not supposed to report back to the church leaders like that, are we? Well, look at what happened. The members mm -hmm. of the council, what? Why not? The members of the council were amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they were ordinary men of no education. And guess what happened next? They realized then that they had been companions of Jesus. And that's what made the difference. Well, they, I mean, well, I'm going to skip over a bunch of verses here. They went to this and they sent them out and they deliberated for a long time and they finally came, told them to come back and says, no, you're never to speak about this Jesus again. No more. Absolutely. Never, never, never again. And Peter's response is, if God says to do so and you say no, who should we obey? God or you? I mean, you know. <laughs> And so, but here, th that's not the end of the story. As soon as Peter and John were set free, they returned to their group. Now they're reporting to a different group, okay? Now we've, we've had the negative report, the negative response, and told them, these are now the Christian Jews, told them what the chief priests and the elders had said. When the believers heard it, they all joined together in prayer to God, Master and Creator of heaven, earth, and sea, and all that is in them. By means of the Holy Spirit, you spoke to our ancestor David, your servant, when he said, Why were the Gentiles furious? Why did people make their useless plots? The kings of the earth prepared themselves, and the rulers met together against the Lord and his Messiah. For indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate, and so forth, it went down. When they finished praying, what's hap what happened? Verse 31, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to proclaim God's message with boldness. Now there's two very contrasting responses to the same report. What do we there say about The result of, of Peter and John sharing was that the whole church was emboldened yeah. and shared even more even though they'd been instructed never to do that. And if you go back, we, we also notice that Jesus had several times when his disciples reported back to him. There were three distinctly different tours that they made through Galilee during that one year when Jesus was preaching and teaching in Galilee. Uh, some of them were found in Matthew 4, 23 to 25, Mark 1, 38 and 39, Matthew 9, 35, Luke 8, 1 to 3, and Luke 9, 1 to 6. It talks about some of these tours. And later he sent out 72 men in Perea, not even in Galilee. This is Gentile area. Luke 10, verse 1. And by the way, we would just mention in passing here that if you're interested in the handouts, which we use as, as our study guides here in our discussion, they're available online. And you can find them under Theox, that's T H E O X dot O R G. T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G under the Sabbath School tab there. Um, aren't, Ken, aren't those things available before? Yes, those are, those are available well in advance of any Sabbath School classes in, in the regular Sabbath. They're, they're available several weeks before the time for the Sabbath, regular Sabbath School class. So as you know, my Sabbath School lesson is coming up the week of, I could pull those down and use those as... Uh, some, Supplement, some contribute items. to my Sabbath yeah. school. Yeah. Or, yeah. Add it to your Sabbath school quarterly and, and, and just add, or, add or some extra ideas. Or even if you're even if you're a teacher there yeah. at the Sabbath school. Or from yeah, Minnesota. exactly. This video and this audio are also available at the same site. Yes, exactly. Well, done with the advertising now. <laughs> <laughs> there were times in Scripture when the reports were not good. Go back to the Old Testament and look at Numbers 13, starting with verse 17. When Moses sent out, and I was talking about the 12 spies, when Moses sent them out, he said to them, go north from here into the southern part of the land, etc., find out everything, etc. So the men went north, verse 21, to explore the land from the wilderness of Zin in the south all the way to Rehob near Mahimoth Pass in the north. They went first into the southern part of the land and came to Hebron where the clans of Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of a race of giants called the Anakim, lived. Hebron was founded seven years before Zoan in Egypt. 
They came to the valley of Eshkol. Eshkol is grapes. They came to the grape valley, and there they took, cut off a branch which had one bunch of grapes on it so heavy that it took two men to carry it on a pole between them. Big but grapes. Big grapes. And big, big group of, cluster of grapes. Big cluster, cluster of grapes. By the way, uh, have any of you, I don't know anybody here, any of you people in the audience uh, have had a chance to visit Israel, but all over Israel you'll find that their, sig their sign of, their, their, their symbol of tourism is grapes. two men carrying a bunch of grapes. <laughs> between, on, on a pole. On a pole oh, between yeah. them, yeah. So, anyway, after exploring the land for 40 days, the spies returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had brought. They said to Moses, we explored the land and found it to be rich. I want you to notice this now very carefully. The land is what? Rich and fertile, and here is some of its fruit. I mean, you know, and everybody's saying, let us have some, right? I would have thought, you've been living in a desert for 40 years and you see some fresh grapes, what would be your response? The kids all would be saying, what's that? <laughs> But the people who live there are powerful and their cities are very large and well fortified. Even worse, we saw the descendants of the giants there. Amalekites live in the southern part of the land. Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites live in the hill country. Canaanites live by the Mediterranean Sea and along the River Jordan. Caleb silenced the, people who, silenced the people who were complaining against Moses and said, we should attack now and take the land. We are strong enough to conquer it. But the men who had gone with Caleb said, no, we are not strong enough to attack them. The people there are more powerful than we are. So they spread a false report among the Israelites about the land they had explored. They said the land doesn't even produce enough to feed the people who live there. Everyone was saw very tall, and we even saw giants there, the sins of Anak. We felt as small as grasshoppers, and that is how we must have looked to them. Now, if you were thinking even half a couple of brain cells working together, you would have said, these guys are, are contradicting. They, what did they say first? Rich. The land is rich and fertile, and here's some of its fruit. And what are they saying later? Is this the same men that are? These are the same men that the land doesn't even produce enough to feed the people who live there. Uh, I mean, no, 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 different men, same same group, but no, these are it's the ten spies. The ten spies. They're both are saying the same. It, one moment they say, "Look at this great, this gorgeous fruit. The, the land is rich and fertile." And a few minutes later, in response to Caleb's promoting the fact that they yeah. should go in and do it right yeah. now, yeah. they're saying, oh no, the land you know, doesn't even support the people who live there. They're giants, and they're way bigger than we are, but the land doesn't support them. I mean, you know, how everybody should have seen through that instantly. Okay, so what does that teach us about reporting back? Be positive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do some people want to do evangelistic and outreach campaigns in hard to service areas? And they say the um, harvest is rich and there are too many people who are negative and say, no, we can't do that for this reason, yeah. this reason, this reason. Paul, after he had become a Christian said, I need to go out and work in the most tough, the toughest places of all, the brand new places. Nobody's been there before because I used to persecute the church. Well, well because of this report and the people's lack of acceptance of it, this is why the Israelites wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, is that yes, correct? that's correct. Well, one important factor to remember, let's, let's be honest, everything. That might be a good reason for not reporting. Yeah, well, well, you would think so. Well, but Caleb and Joshua, they gave a good report if they had just believed their report. So one important factor to remember about these biblical events is that there, at that point in time, there, were no, there was no public media. There were no newspapers, no radio, no television, no news reporters. News in those days spread by mouth from one person to another. When it was reported that something very significant was happening, it was a custom of people to flock to that location to see for themselves. So think about how that might affect the whole reporting scene. So a lesson here is you better be positive or you're going to get punished. Well, let, let, let's, let, let's think about that. Be honest. honest. Yes. Yeah. 
I mean, certainly God doesn't want us to bring back a lying report, which is what those ten spies did. They, they just flatly contradicted themselves. Why would they do that? They were afraid. And a, a few hours later, they were all dead. So and they were dead at God's command. That that should have taught. That should have said something to the children of Israel. So what did they did? What what was their response? They said, "Let's go back to Egypt." And Moses said, "Okay, if you want to go back to the desert, go back to the desert." And oh no, we don't want to go back to the desert. We want to go forward. W whether God blesses us or not, we'll conquer the land. Let us go. And thousands of them died. I mean, they were, they were as perverse as they could possibly be. Whatever God said, they want to do just the opposite. Well, so. they could have been, also could have been afraid because, I don't know, I'm getting my story mixed up. This is, uh, I was thinking they'd been in the wilderness for 40 years, but no, this is True. what caused them to. This is at the beginning of that. It's a good thing that we aren't like those Israelites mm. of, of that day and that we've only been wandering in the wilderness here a hundred and about a hundred and what is it, a hundred and seventy years? Is, yeah. After eighteen forty four. Well, but look what happened when they when they decided that they had made the wrong decision. They they lacked faith. And so now they have plenty of faith. We can go in and and conquer things. We've made well, a mistake they before. We presumption, need presumption, not faith. This wasn't faith. They 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 want to do it on their own. They didn't want to do it with God's help. I mean, they couldn't do it. They didn't believe they could do it with God's help. And now they're trying to do it by themselves. How foolish can you be? Well, sounds pretty typical. Well, there's another story about reporting that's very significant and which we often don't talk about. It's found in Acts 21 verses 19 to 25. Let's go there. Now, I need, to, I need to fill in some of the details. This is at the end of Paul's third missionary journey. He's been working three years in Ephesus. He, he's, worried, he's been writing letters to the Corinthians because there's problems over there. He goes over to Corinth, gets things sorted out. Meanwhile, he hears there's problems back at home in, 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 in Judea. So he starts collecting a huge offering, an enormous offering, for the benefit of the people back in Judea. And so he says, you know, it's not safe for me to carry this offering by myself. So he gets a bunch of other people, several other people to travel with him to carry this wealth, basically, back to Jerusalem. He gets back to Jerusalem. They go in to the Christian believers. Now, fortunately, none of these people are, ma are named. I hope this wasn't Peter, James, and John. But they come back to these believers, and they pour out this wealth on the table. And the, Ellen White says... The hearts of the, the, the Christian believers, the Christian leaders, were temporarily warmed. So look at what it says here. Paul greeted them and gave a complete reward of everything that God had done among the Gentiles for his work. After hearing him, they all praised God, and after receiving a big offering. Then they said, Brother Paul, you can see how many thousands of Jews have become believers, and how devoted they all are to the law. Now, who was, being, who was the most successful at spreading the gospel at that point in time? Was it among the Jews or was it among the Gentiles? Well, we, cer we certainly have plenty of report about the Gentiles. Yes. Yeah. We have thousands that were converted among the Jews at the time of Pentecost. Yeah. Yeah. And apparently thousands more. Yes. And, you know, there's similar experience even with Jesus. He seemed to have... Quite a bit of success, in, and you know, with Samaritans and those kinds of things. Uh, and on the Friday when he was crucified, how many people rallied around him? One That's other thief on the one thief on one the one disciple and a couple of people from the Sanhedrin and a few women. Well, anyway, getting back to Paul's story, they said, Paul. You know, people have heard that you're just converting an awful lot of Gentiles out there, and they, they've heard that, that you're telling that they don't have to follow all the Jewish rules. Now, we would like you to do this, and they suggested a very cowardly thing. Would you please shave your head with these Jewish believers, Jewish Christians, and they're going to do the old Jewish thing. They're going to the temple. They're going to go through this long ceremony and, and, and see if, if, you know, we, we can convince... 
you, you can convince the Jewish believers that, that you haven't given up the faith. And what was the result? He got imprisoned. Hmm? They imprisoned him later. Yeah. He was, he was seen in the so. temple by a Jew from, from somewhere, we don't know for sure, maybe from Corinth, maybe from Ephesus. Somebody had seen him over there and said, this is the guy that's, you know, whatever like this. And he was arrested and almost killed and so forth. And Paul ended up spending most of the rest of his life in prison as now, a result of that. Are you saying that the Jewish people no longer considered Paul a Jew? Oh, they didn't. They did not. And, and so because he had been converting too many Gentiles? Now, hold on. You need to keep sev several groups separate here. It's, it's sometimes a little confusing. The Jews who are, who are not Christians were very opposed to Paul because he would go into synagogues, he would convince a lot of people to become Christians, and they would leave the synagogue mm -hmm. out in those other areas where Paul did his preaching. And they, they, as far as they were concerned, Paul was tearing apart the Jewish religion. Well, he was, wasn't he? Well, <laughs> that's the way they perceived it, at least. Paul would say, I'm improving on the Jewish religion. Mm. That's what he would say. Well, so th it was some of those people who, 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 who saw Paul in the temple and, and, and led to his arrest. But it was the Jewish believers, the ones who should have been the faithful Christians, who told Paul to go and do that thing. And Ellen White says, and Acts of the Apostles, do to do that thing. ceremony with those other people, to prove that he was a real tried and true Jew. And remember Paul had said, when I'm with Gentiles, I behave like a Gentile. When I'm with a Jew, I behave like a Jew, so that by all means I may do what? Win a few. I may win some. So the Jewish Christians were really uncomfortable with the Gentile Christians. Yes. Well, they were uncomfortable with how many Gentile Christians Paul was, was winning. He could win a few, but when the numbers got too big... Well, you know... When they had a vote, who's going to win, the Jews or the Gentiles? Yeah, pretty soon this, Christ, this, this Christian church might end up being a Gentile church. I mean, what a terrible thought, you know? Well, Gentiles were kind of strangers to them. Yes. Because they grew up all their lives staying away, and now yeah. they're coming in. Yeah. They're, they're bringing in their weird ways of doing things, and we've got to live with these guys, and um, <laughs> we just got to make them into Jews so that we'll be more comfortable with them. Yeah. Now, if we get too many new people into our church, are we kind of uncomfortable? Well, I was, I didn't, I didn't know whether we should discuss that or not. <laughs> do, well, we feel, do we feel comfortable if some of our church members get out there and start associating with non-Adventists and maybe even bring some of them to church? Well, they, don't you they think there's not, a... They are not uh, potty trained yet? They're not potty trained yet. Well, a few are okay, but you know... Some of them are okay. Start, yeah, but do they continue to teach them, or do they just yeah. race to a plateau and just stay, stay there and then maybe fall away, or do they well, constantly expand I, in their understanding? Uh, let's, let's, take, let's take another example. How do we respond as, as good, faithful church members when we hear that the gospel is just exploding in some other parts of the world? Do we say, well, you know, those people, you know, we should stop worrying about them. We need to do something here. Let's, let's save our, our, our tithe dollars and our, our offering dollars. We want to do something right here. Let those people do what they can do out there. Or, or do we support the church's efforts in other parts of the world? When you hear some of those stories out of India, how, how yeah. the, the more they try to oppress the, yeah. the, the, the more it explodes. It's yeah. just, it's tremendous. Well, Here, we got too many, it's like a big smorgasbord and, and the people whose lives are maybe too comfortable. Yeah. So why do they want to change? Why would you want to look around? Maybe we need to change people everywhere. Wow. Well, we're, we're focusing on reporting, so let me, let me bring some points. What, why is reporting back to the church so important? Well, let's look at some possibilities. One, even if we are doing a great work, if we do not report it to others, it will not help to encourage the church to get involved in evangelistic activities. Two, it will encourage church members to feel that something is actually happening and being done. I remember one lady that I witnessed to, and the, one of the first questions she asked was, is anything happening in your church? 
She'd been to a lot of other churches, and she says, I, I, I'm not talking about is they're having committees and do they go to church services or what? I want to know if people are really being changed. That was her actual words. Are people really being changed? <clears throat> By that, do you, do you mean that some people will hear and, and warm to the story of, of what is being reported and say, I want to get involved in that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Three, God's Holy Spirit will move among the congregation as we make such reports to encourage others to step out and get involved in one way or another. And, I mean, we need to be honest. I mean, the biblical stories are there. When we report back and when we say something to the church group, but even to the leaders in the church, things will happen. They're, whether we like it or not, people will be evaluating in their mind one way or another about our report. And then certain actions will be taken. Some people may like it. Some people may not like it. Decisions will be made. Yes, I will. No, I won't. And responses are planned. And if, it, if it's a good report and people, enough people there are, are positive about it, it may lead to, to other. And if you look through the book of Acts, well, let's look at a few of those verses. Look at Acts 5.14, for example. What is the result of all this feedback to the church and so forth? Uh-oh. Hold on, just a second. We'll, we'll get back here. Uh, verse 14. But more and more people were added to the group, a crowd of men and women who believed in the Lord. Well, let's look at a couple of other verses. Look at Acts 8, verse 4. The believers who were scattered went everywhere preaching the message. And um, also uh, 8, verse 12. Look at that one. Uh, but when they believed Peter's message about the good news of the kingdom of God and about Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, and we could go on reading. Lots, I mean, it, the bottom line is that in, in the book of Acts, people would went out and they did things and people flocked into the church. Can you really compare back then to what, today? Well, that would be my, one of my next questions. I mean, for, for one thing, we don't have... We never have meetings where earthquakes start happening. We never have groups together praying and flames come up on their top of their head. Why um, do you think that is? Well, uh, maybe we haven't got it together. Well, okay, that may be true, but we're not talking about that problem. We're talking, we about, talking about that problem. We're talking about reporting and whether it's good or not. Well, but, but if, if we could report that kind of stuff, things would happen, I think. Well, that would be true, but I don't see it happening. Why do you think the, the disciples seemed to be so successful in those early years to the point where even their enemies said, these, people have, these, these disciples have turned the world upside down in one generation? Acts 17, 6 just says that in so many words. Well, for one thing, they got to live with Jesus, actually live with him physically, You've got the whole story in front of you there. Well, I know, but don't you think a living person that you could go fall around would be better than even this? That's not what Jesus said. No. Jesus yeah. says, I've got to get out of here so that this, this, this message can get worldwide. But whether you say that or not, the, the fact is that these people that are shaking the world are the ones that saw Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, it, and it could be that in... In their day, they got to live intimately with Jesus and had that experience. But today, it's different. It's what we're supposed to live with is the Holy Spirit. Well, was their message so, so, so startling because they, had, they knew God personally? Well, you know, these people had enthusiasm. Um, mm. They were motivated by enthusiasm. Now, how much enthusiasm do you see in the people in the church today? Sometimes I see them coming out of the service and they just, it's just blah. Well, and, okay. but, and sometimes you have enthusiasm and you talk to someone and they're just like, uh, throw what do you call, cold water in your face or whatever. Well, they don't want symptom? you to have. And she talking about a symptom? But, but these people okay. had all enthusiasm. You, all how you're many, doing. All you, yeah, but you're saying that all you got to do is be enthusiastic. Run in there and jump up and down no. and everything and everything will work. Some people have enthusiasm for evangelism, but it's not 
really accepted a lot of times. Mm -hmm. are, are we saying, Ken, that because we don't have miracles, then there's something wrong with our evangelism? Okay. Uh, you know, let, let me I'm get not you. sure that's, that you know, mir that's, that's yeah. is that... Oh. Oh, but a miracle is okay. a convert. A miracle is I'm, someone that understands yeah. God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my personal example. Some years ago, I was attending a university on the eastern coast of the United States. I, my wife and I joined a small church, small Adventist church there. We were there just for about a year. Uh, we joined this small church. Just about the same time we joined, a doctor came and he said, I would like to try an experiment. He said, I would like to join this small church and I'd like to conduct a number of health programs in connection with the pastor. He liked the pastors. The two of us will work together. We'll do these programs. And if the church is willing to cooperate, it means everybody needs to get involved. If the church is willing to cooperate, I think we can do some great things. And we started doing five-day plans because that was the days of five-day plans to stop smoking. We did, we did cooking schools. We did exercise programs. It wasn't very long before people were booked in, in months in advance to get into those church programs. And every one of those church programs, church members, it, when a stop smoking plan, there would be three or four smokers and there had to be two Adventist church members from that little church there to coach them, to guide them, to say, to help them and say, yeah, like this. That little church within about nine months almost doubled its membership. Now those weren't all new baptisms. There were a number of new baptisms, but they, their people from other Adventist church said, things are happening in this church, let's go to that church. Enthusiasm is catching. Absolutely. And we I, even, mm -hmm. and let me just say one more okay. thing. We actually met a, 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 the wife of a pastor who had, of another church, a, a Sunday keeping church that had, that had recent, the pastor had recently passed away. And the wife, of course, still attended faithfully the church that his, her husband had helped to build up. But she called us up. She says, I, I visited your church one time and I really like what was happening there. Would you be willing to come by my, because her house was just sort of on the, our way to the church. She came to our church every Sabbath. She went to her church on Sunday, but she came to our church on Sabbath just because she was so excited about what was happening there. Now, don't tell me that can't happen in our day because I was there and I saw it. But what is it that's doing that, though? Is it leadership? Is it, is it people going in there and getting excited, like she well, says? Or what is it exactly? And why isn't it happening over here? Why isn't it happening yeah. in another church that somebody might be listening here? Yeah. I think How come when, it isn't happening? When people care about people. That doctor wanted to care about mm -hmm. the people, and he wanted to care in a faith way. And so he says, would you be willing to get enthusiastic with me and I need your help doing this? And uh, people didn't sit back and say no, you know, and, and stuff, but they all did it like a sports yeah. team. And sports yeah. teams that are enthusiastic they often win. Yeah. So that's all you need that it'll work? You need an interest in doing it. On the, con on the topic of, of miracles, Desire of Ages 832.3, and when the virtue from Christ entered into these poor souls, they were convicted of sin and many were healed of their spiritual disease as well as of their physical maladies. The gospel still possesses the same power. And then she asked this question, why should we not today witness the same results? Well, that's a good question. Why? That's what we're doing here. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> well that, anyway, that, that implies that we should see it. Yeah, the we Adventist, should say it, but why not? The Adventist health message does heal people. Yes, it does. And, and so it's not the person has to participate, but it does heal people. Well, we're, ta we're trying to focus on reporting, and I, I, love, <laughs> the, I love the discussions. And These are the kind of questions we need to talk about. We, we ought to have every Adventist church around the globe being asking these questions of themselves. But now let, 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 let's, let's be more, a little more specific. Are, are we, though, talking about something to report? Well, let me ask a question. When an evangelistic <laughs> program is successful, we traditionally give God the credit. That's the right thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. But if an evangelistic program seems to be unsuccessful, who do we blame? Do we blame God? I don't think there is such a thing as an unsuccessful. 
because you get people thinking and the seed may sprout later mm -hmm. on down the road. I would not want to say that anything is unsuccessful. Well, you know, the guy I used to, th the person I think about when you talk about unsuccessful attempts is Edison. And he did thousands of things that didn't work before he came up with a whole bunch of things that did work. Mm -hmm. And he was probably the greatest inventor this country has ever seen. And his, re his response when someone asked him, what about all these things that didn't work? He said, if you learned something, it wasn't a failure. Correct. Mm -hmm. And we need to take that attitude. So at first, if you don't succeed, try, try again, yeah. that's what you're saying? Sure. Well, learn you know. from it and try, try again. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess you could possibly have a whole life of trying. <laughs> well, there's a, yeah, no, <laughs> and, but, but if you're really trying and you're, on it, you're trying the right way, you're trying to let, ask God to guide you and you're studying your Bible and you're, and you're trying to look at ways. I mean, think of all the ways we could talk about. We have, you know, leaflets you can pass out. You can, little books that you can pass out. Uh, um, Bible studies, they're pre-prepared if you think that's the kind of approach you need. I mean, there are, the, the number of approaches that have been suggested are legion. There's probably a new approach being suggested every week. But it suffers from lack of people that want to do that. Yeah. You asked, why is it not happening today? Evangelism uh, 696. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, the unconsecration and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. That's why it doesn't work. Okay, so she's talking about us even here around the table. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, how are you going to fix yourself from... Okay, Repair what yourself. am I going to do? Yeah. The only thing that I know to do is by beholding and, and ask him to take it over and make it different. And I want to be part of seeing that work today. The only problem is that there's no timeline to that. Well, let, 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 let me make a suggestion here. Um, sometimes we, we look out at the world and we say, hmm, that looks like that's a program that works pretty well for doing business or something else like this. So I'm going to try to adapt that to my evangelistic program. So we, we work things all out, and we have this big fancy thing all worked out. And oh, oh, suddenly we remember, God, could you please bless us as we go about our evangelistic program? Right. And whose evangelistic program is it? It's our evangelistic program. We need to be talking to God at the beginning, saying, God, what would you like me to do? And, and getting guidance from him and, and, and saying, you know, he may want us just to talk to our neighbor and say, you know, how about um, doing something with me on, 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 on Saturday? Yeah. We've got some good act Sabbath afternoon activities that our church is sponsoring or whatever it happens to be. You know, something for the kids. We've got all kinds of church programs for kids. Invite the kids over. I mean, there's lots of choices. So you... you you ask God first. You don't kind yeah. of leave it to the pastor no. and say, well, when is he going to do something? Yeah. Um, so. Can you yeah. ask, uh, how do we, you know, when we have something, su a successful campaign, do we credit God or unsuccessful, who do you credit? How do we determine whether a program is successful or unsuccessful? That there, is there, a there's several very, ways that we've traditionally yes, done it. Yes. And traditionally, the church wants to report three things. One, they want to know how many people were baptized. Mm -hmm. Two, they want to know how much money was raised. And three, generally, they want to know how, how many new churches were started. Those are the kind of things that get reported. I thought there's there something three. else that we should be looking at? <laughs> yeah, what we would like to know is how many people actually are ready to enter the kingdom of heaven. But, but we, we don't have, have any way of measuring. We don't have any way of measuring that. That's that's a real disadvantage, isn't it? Well, I thought the three things was how many people are going to be baptized, how many people are going to be baptized, and how many people are going to be baptized. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it seems like that. Yeah. Well, look at another example from the Bible. Look at Acts chapter 11. Now, I'm going to skip over all of chapter 10. Chapter 10 is the predecessor, is the, is, the, is the setting for chapter 11. In chapter 10, you remember Peter was down on the coast of, of Judea at the house of a tanner. Now, Peter was already, you know, 
departing from his sincere, serious Jewish roots because what do tanners do all day long? Deal with dead animals. Deal with dead animals, which according to the Levitical rules, did, does what to you? They, they are unclean. Makes you unclean. So here's Peter staying in this tanner's house. So he's unclean. He's living in the house of an unclean, well, he's staying there temporarily, an unclean situation. But he's to, he receives this vision of the sheet that comes down in heaven, all these unclean animals, and, and God says, rise and eat. You know, he does this three times. And then these Gentiles show up at his door and say, Peter, we'd like you to come up and preach the gospel to a Roman centurion. Imagine it. A Roman centurion? And what does Peter do? Well, we, 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 there's some very important parts of this story that we, for, we often jump over. He took six other people with him. And why did he take six people with him? He needed witnesses. <laughs> he needed witnesses. He says, if I'm going to go up there and try to witness to a Gentile, I've got to have lots of support here. So he took six church members with him. He went up there. And we know the story of Cornelius and his whole family uh, joined, became Christians. The Holy Spirit descended upon them. We don't know exactly what, what that means, but the Holy Spirit depended upon them. And so Peter went back. And then a little while later, Peter went to Jerusalem. Peter must have been quite a salesman to get six people to go up there and meet with that Gentile up there because they were going to get defiled too. Yeah. Well, the apostles and the other, I'm reading now, Acts 11, the apostles and the other believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. Do you think they were shocked or do you think what? Horrified. When Peter went to Jerusalem, those who were in favor of circumcising Gentiles, who would those be? Judea. Probably the former, the former Pharisees, mm -hmm. criticized him saying, you were a guest in the home of an uncircumcised Gentile and you ate with them. So Peter gave them a complete account of what had happened from the very beginning. And then he gives his report, all the whole thing. And look at verse 12. The Spirit told me to go with them without hesitation. These six fellow believers from Joppa accompanied me to Caesarea, and we all went into the house of Cornelius. Why did he do that? He knew he needed some support when he went back to Jerusalem. So he, he, they all stood up, and what was the result? When I began to speak, the, verse 15, the Holy Spirit came down on them just as on us at the beginning. Oh boy, mm. now what are we going to do? Now we're in trouble. Then I remember what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is clear that God gave these Gentiles the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I then to try to stop God? So now how often is that? Well, let me read the, the next sentence. When they heard this, they stopped their criticism and praised God, saying, then, Gentile, then God has given to the Gentiles also the opportunity to repent and live. Oh dear, what are we going to do now? Gentiles are joining the church. Watch out for the Gentiles. <laughs> Watch out for the Gentiles. But God was leading the way and giving proof that. And it turns out that this Cornelius was already a follower, what they called a follower of the way. He, he had he helped them build, it, he'd helped them with a lot of ways. He supported the Jewish cause. He was interested in the Jewish religion. So this wasn't like a complete stranger. To, but he to was the, a Gentile. But he was a Gentile and a Roman at that. Yeah. But you notice that, that there was always a connection to God with, his, with these actions, mm -hmm. with the Gentiles, something... Something, there was a sign there that God's approval was with it. Do we need God to take some pretty direct actions to get us to move out of our prejudices? Yeah. We don't have any prejudices, right? I was going to ask, no. what prejudices do you think we have? <laughs> no, no. Why was it? Name it, we got it. <laughs> Duty is a bad word. Well, Maybe Revelation 3 <laughs> and the message to the Laodiceans might be a clue. What did, what did they say? What did he, God say to us there? Put eye salve on your eyes so, so you, you can, can see. see. And buy me good, good clothes so you can have something to wear and get the gold of faith and love. 
Do we need any help? Well, why was it so hard for the Jews, even the Jewish believers, to accept the idea that God wanted the gospel to go to everyone? I mean, it's, if you look carefully, it's all through the Old Testament. Way back when, when God was first talking to Abraham, Genesis 12, then the Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your relatives, and your family's home, and go to a land that I'm going to show you. Abraham was the first missionary. I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you. And through you, I will bless only the Jews? No, all the nations. All the nations. I mean, that's just one of many, many verses that suggest the same idea. Why couldn't the Jews get it? Did Abraham get it? Did he ever develop the concept that... All that wandering around all of the time was a, a significant component well, of that. He was, was having a hard time having any children himself, but he managed to raise, uh, he had enough followers that when war attacked, when the enemy came and captured his, his nephew, he had enough workers that worked for him and believed like he did. They, he raised a, a military army of 318 men that actually worked for him. I don't know how many others wouldn't, didn't qualify. And but when you read the passage, it said they were skilled with mm -hmm. those types of things. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't consider the whole church Laodicean because um, there is so much. Um, I mean, the Adventist church has more TV, radio stations than I think <laughs> a lot of churches do. And they're reaching all the people. I don't see any discrimination on uh, the Adventists that are, in, I consider, enthusiastic. Okay. Well, let, let's, we're, we're, at, we're not close to running out of time, but we're getting down there. Let's, let's, let's look at several things. One, when we report back to the church, we need to be honest. I mean, the spies, they were dishonest. The 10 spies were dishonest. Uh, look at the people. Peter brought those six people with him because he said, I want to make sure that we get this story straight. I'm not going to let anybody distort it. distort it. Paul came to the church believers and he said, the Christian church leaders, he said, look at what's happening among the, gospel, among the Gentiles. And he said, well, but we really wish you would do something to help us in our work with the Jews. And I mean, what do all those stories tell us? But one issue that we face, when, which the early disciples did not face, was a media-saturated world. Major news gets transmitted around the world almost instantly. People have become accustomed to getting their information in sound bites. In this context, how do we get people to take the gospel seriously? How do we get them to recognize that a book that is thousands of years old is still relevant in any way at all? Okay? Don't everybody talk at once. Why? Well, you, you think we can come up with a plan right now? Well, we I... go together? <laughs> put it on their iPad. You put it on... There you go. I think people get sick of sound bites. Mm -hmm. They want something deeper. They want something that makes sense. There's a lot of living principles, psychology in this mm -hmm. book that help people. Yeah. Well, and this is one of the questions. Do we need to compete with the world for sound bites? Do we need to compete with, with the world for glitzy media? No. The disciples were invigorated by the news they had to carry. How would you convince, think about this today, how would you convince a friend today that a personal friend of yours had risen from the dead? Well, I can't convince them because no one that I know has been risen from the dead. Yes, someone you know has been risen from the dead. Maybe it happened 2,000 years ago, but it was true. And a lot of people don't believe it. How are you going to convince them that it's the truth? You convince them by the change in you. Okay. Well, you know, I think if, say that you belong to a sleepy church and nothing's happening, it's kind of boring, you can't hardly get your kids over there or anything, what's the first step you got to do? I mean, it's like what we covered here is you you ask God, well, what can we do? You mm -hmm. start with something, and it could be a small thing. Yes. Tell everybody what you're planning on doing and see what happens. Mm -hmm. You'll probably have something to report after you do that little thing. 
And it, those are the kind of things that you have to do to start something a little bigger next time, and a little bigger next time, and a little bigger next time. So um, here's, yeah, okay. This is what Ellen White says about those early efforts by the disciples. They begin to realize, this is Acts of the Apostles, page 27, first paragraph. They begin to realize the nature and extent of their work, to see that they were to proclaim to the world the truths entrusted to them. The events of Christ's life, his death and resurrection, the prophecies pointing to these events, the mysteries of the plan of salvation, the power of Jesus for the remission of sins, to all these things they had been witnesses and they were to make them known to the world. They were to proclaim the gospel of peace and salvation through repentance and the power of the Savior. Pretty powerful stuff. Is it still true today? Should be. Has the basic, have the basic ideas of Christianity become blasé, old hat, uninteresting anymore? Well, part of the problem, I think, that people are kind of not willing to try them out, mm -hmm. you know? They just, um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think uh, they've gotten tired of what they should get tired of. Mm -hmm. But there is a, there is a level of enthusiasm, a level of uh, commitment that even somebody who's tired of the, quote, religion mm -hmm. will respond to when they see it. Okay. Well, you know, people today are probably more miserable, more sick, more overweight, more uh, depressed with all the pills they're taking than they have ever been. And the church has a huge message to bring to the people to improve their lives in this world according to, to live the Christian life. And, and that creates happiness. So we have we have a most miserable, confused world. They don't know what's going on. Um, substance abuse, mm -hmm. um, everything. So we have, a, as Jesus says, the harvest is um, plentiful, but the workers are few. All of us have been called to go out and witness. We, we've read the verses of Matthew 28, and there's other places, 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. It calls us all to go out and witness. If we go out, in our humble, even stumbling kind of a way, do you think God will bless us? Absolutely. Yeah. If we're trying to make an honest effort? Yeah. I think we've seen that in teaching. Even when yeah. you try to make an honest effort in teaching and you make an idiot of yourself or whatever, the kids like the effort yeah. and, and um, they'll help you improve. <laughs> it's interesting. I know about a, a school where there were, there were two teachers. One of the teachers was brilliant. You could give him almost any kind of a thing, and he could see through the answer just real quick. But the students, he, 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 he would get up and he'd say, you know, this is the way it is, do, 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 do. and the students would huh? You know? And there was another teacher that you really wonder how he even became a teacher. The kids had to help him. The uh, kids would, like, almost have to help him to solve the math problems on the board. But by the time he got done explaining, everybody in the room understood <laughs> it. <laughs> So maybe that teacher should teach us something. I, I know the st a story of an, of an elderly gentleman who um, was blind. And he would go around to the homes in his neighbor. In fact, sometimes he would go to other streets. And he'd go around the block, knock on the door, and they would, people would come to the door. He says, excuse me, said, I'm blind. And, and I have a book here I, I really would like to read, but I can't read it. Would you be willing to take a few minutes and read a chapter of this book for me? And it was great controversy. And he won more people for the gospel than anybody else in that church. Now, was that a humble way? Sure. Now you can say, oh, but he had an advantage. He was blind. You going to call that an advantage? Well, it sounds like something has to be ventured. Mm -hmm. We yeah. need to venture something. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be glitzy. Mm -hmm. Just enough that you know that you're doing it for the Lord. Mm -hmm. Try it out, see what happens, see if you can report something after it's been done. 
and maybe we need there even there is even a place, and I would very strongly suggest that there's a place for witnessing to other Adventists mm -hmm. to get them inspired. And one of the one way to do that, one way that all of us have experienced and, and become excited about, is going through the Bible book by book. And if you're interested in trying that, we have handouts to help you all the way through the Bible on our on our website. Um, theox.org, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Look there under the teacher's guides, the study guides. There's study guides and there's teacher guides. Now, we haven't quite finished everything from the New Testament, but all the Old Testament is there, and we're finishing up the New Testament. So that's you another really possibility. Need, you don't need a theolo theologian on no. your group either because the Holy Spirit's been promised yeah. for any group that prays for it. Yeah. Well, Christianity was the very first religion to actually try to evangelize others. I mean, all the religions that preceded Christianity, they, they regarded themselves as localized religions. This religion belongs to us and here, and you people stay out, you have your religion, you go back there. But Christianity said, no, we're going to go to the world. We want everybody to become Christians. What's happened to that, that message, that fervor, that determination? Um, we do not expect people to speak with tongues or look, exhibit miraculous manifestations of, of, their converse, of their conversion. What should we look for as evidence that they have become real Christians? And what should we do if there are other members of the church, in the church who do not approve of some method we're using to try to evangelize? Even different methods and, uh, and the use of different media can raise questions and conflicts between members. Consider these attitudes. What do you think of these? The church should avoid all forms of media, focusing instead on door-to-door, -door, face to face ministry. We ought to get on your horse, too, yeah. at the same time. <laughs> well, some people say the church should use all forms of technology in order to share its message with the membership and with the world. Another group might say the church should avoid glitzy advertising campaigns. The gospel doesn't need to be dressed up. Another group might say, through the careful use of media, the church should manage its image. In doing so, members will take pride in their church and new believers will, become, will come to admire the church's work and practice. Those of us who believe in what we call the Great Controversy Trust Healing Model, the plan of salvation, should realize that there is some very important information that needs to be given to many church members as well. How should we go about doing that? Do we need to conduct a revival series? Could we invite people to our homes to take them through the Bible book by book? What preparation is needed to become a part of the 144,000? Have you ever asked yourself that? Would you like to be a part of that group? See you next week.